everyone. Uh, today I'll be talking to you about our efforts to use nanopore sequencing to circularize bacterial genomes directly from the human gut microbiome. So in the bot lab, we study the human gut microbiome because it's very important for human health and disease. There are a number of ways in which it impacts us. For example, in our ability to extract energy from food, to regulate our metabolism, to out-colonize and protect us against pathogens, to regulate our immune system, and to produce essential vitamins. However, our understanding of the microbiome is incomplete. We know very few of the species that are present there, let alone what functions they might be having. So there are a few ways that we can continue to illuminate this space. One is through isolation and culture. However, isolation and culture is limited in throughput, and it's also limited to those bacteria that can be cultured. An alternative approach is with shotgun metagenomics, and by directly sequencing DNA extracted from stool, we can then perform de novo assembly of bacterial genomes and get a more untargeted, holistic view of what bacteria are there. And so de novo assembly uh, follows this pipeline. First, we extract DNA, sequence short reads, assemble those reads into contigs, and then because this is metagenomics, we bin those contigs based off of similar characteristics, such as tetranucleotide frequency or similar relative abundance. And so those contigs are binned into draft genome bins, and we call them metagenome assembled genomes. However, bins sometimes are very accurate, other times they can be incomplete or they can be contaminated with contigs that actually should belong to other genomes. So there have been some real tour de force efforts lately, especially in the past year, to assemble lots and lots of microbial genomes uh, directly from stool. And so these metagenome assembled genome projects have sequenced thousands and thousands of individuals and have produced hundreds of thousands of medium and high quality bacterial genomes from stool. And a lot of these projects have focused on sequencing people from a diverse range of lifestyles, geographies, age, health status, et cetera, and have really helped give us a, a more holistic view into what species are present in the human gut. However, these metagenome assembled genomes generated with short reads often are very fragmented, and often these fragmentations occur at mobile genetic elements. So mobile genetic elements includes a large class of different genomic elements that are often repetitive within or among bacterial genomes. And so this can include phage, insertion sequences, transposons, mites, and lots of things in between. And a lot of these elements can be repeated multiple times within a bacterial genome because they can autonomously or non-autonomously transpose. And they can also transfer horizontally between bacteria, for example, phage. And so some of these elements can carry cargo, so different genetic material with them. Others can influence gene expression. And they mediate all sorts of diverse phenotypes that are very important for our health, such as virulence of their hosts or antibiotic resistance. And so we wanted to be able to assemble bacterial genomes directly from the gut that can resolve where these elements are. And to do that, you need a closed bacterial genome. However, long read sequencing was previously very untenable in the gut microbiome space because it was quite difficult to, uh, to generate short or long DNA from the gut microbiome. So I'll talk to you a little bit about our efforts to develop an extraction approach and a computational protocol for the long read sequencing of stool. So standard DNA extraction in gut microbiome labs uh, yields very fragmented DNA. And this is because uh, since bacterial cells are very hard to lyse and because there's all sorts of other material in stool, um, we tend to extract DNA with this machine called a bead beater. And for that, we put stool into tubes, we add beads, and shake it vigorously for a very long time. And so you could imagine that this yields very, very fragmented DNA that's often in the hundreds or low thousands of base pairs. So uh, Eli Moss in our lab spent a long time developing a very nice method for the extraction of highly intact DNA from stool. And so instead of using a bead beating approach, he uses enzymatic cell wall degradation using metapolyzyme, which is a mix of different lytic enzymes. And then we go through different uh, purification steps. We use proteinase K, RNase A, we do gravity column purification, and then we select for high molecular weight DNA using spry beads. 
And so with this enzymatic approach, we're now able to yield these very nice peaks of high molecular weight DNA, often ranging from 10,000 to 45,000 base pairs in size. And so these elements are now long enough to span the full length of these repetitive elements, which often are in um, the low hundreds of base pairs up to a couple thousand base pairs. So then after sequencing this DNA, uh, Eli also developed a new method for the assembly and processing of these long reads. And so we do a two-fold assembly with either canoe or fly, and then we have some, uh, some misassembly detection steps. We merge those assemblies. We uh, check large megabase scale contigs to see if they can be circularized. We do a consensus refinement with short reads or long reads, and then a final misassembly detection step. So we did an initial validation of this approach using a 12-member mock community mix from ATCC. And so here I'm showing uh, in each of these plots a individual bacterial genome. The inner tracts in black are the short read assemblies. The outer tracts in different colors are the nanopore assemblies. And you can see those white lines are identifying breaks in the assemblies. So as you guys can see from these plots, those outer colored nanopore assemblies are much more contiguous than the corresponding short read assemblies. And in some cases, for example, this green assembly in the middle, um, we had full circular assemblies in a single contact of those bacterial genomes. So as we were able to do this in a mock community, we decided to apply this method to circularize bacterial genomes directly from stool. So just on our first initial samples, we were able to generate many circular genomes, and many of these were the first circular genomes of their represented bacteria, and um, were much more contiguous than short read assemblies and also more contiguous than read cloud assemblies. And read clouds are a short read 10x genomics-based approach that uses barcoding of long fragments to generate more long-range information with short reads. But nanopore consistently outperformed both of those approaches. Again, I'm showing you these circos plots where the outer track is the nanopore assemblies. One particularly interesting bacteria that we saw here was Prevotella copri, um, which you can see the read cloud and short read assemblies are highly fragmented. So zooming into that genome, Prevotella copri is a highly prevalent and highly abundant gut bacteria. It's found in people across the world, and often it's one of the most abundant species that we have in our guts. And so you can see this full circular blue nanopore assembly compared to the yellow and red very fragmented short read and read cloud assemblies. Interestingly, if you look at that inner track that's highlighted in black, uh, there I'm marking all instances of insertion sequences. So one of the reasons that Prevotella copri had evaded assembly until now, even with as much as 5,000x coverage of the genome, is because it has so many insertion sequences. It has over 100. Um, and this represents about five different insertion sequences that are repeated many times across this genome. And so if we look um, look more closely at where these insertion sequences are and what they're doing, we can get an idea of how this nanopore sequencing allows us to um, decipher a little bit more of what phenotypes P. copri might have and what environmental exposures it might be faced with. So here I'm plotting the P. copri genome linearly across the x-axis, and those black bars are marking locations of insertion sequences. The y-axis is showing you what fraction of P. copri reads that insertion sequence is found in, so what its relative prevalence is in that population of P. copri. And so this is one time point from an individual. If we look at their same P. copri but 15 months later, we can see that that relative abundance of different insertion sequences has changed. And so I'd like to highlight just a couple examples of why I think that this is really interesting. First, looking at these two insertion sequences, one is adjacent to a gene that is involved in multi-drug export. And the second is next to a gene that is involved in capsule biosynthesis and biofilm formation. And so the abundance of these insertion sequences has gone up over time. So if these insertion sequences happen to carry outward-facing promoters, they could be increasing the expression of these genes and aiding that particular P. copri in its antibiotic resistance. An alternative example are these insertion sequences, which are adjacent to genes for alginate biosynthesis and extended-spectrum beta-lactamases. And so alginate biosynthesis contributes to bacterial capsule formation, again, a mechanism for antibiotic resistance. The extended spectrum beta-lactamases degrade beta-lactam antibiotics, um, leading to resistance to beta-lactams. And so these ones we see have gone down 
in uh, the P. copri population. So this could be that these insertion sequences are being excised. It could be the case that we had multiple substrain populations of E. coli, or sorry, P. copri, and that those have changed in abundance. One last example are these insertion sequences that are adjacent to genes related to nutrient utilization. So SUS-C and SUS-E are both genes uh, in polysaccharide utilization loci that contribute to the import and utilization of complex sugars. And then beta-galactosidase is also related to nutrient utilization. And we've seen that all of these insertion sequences also go down in abundance. So this could be giving us some insight into the changing nutritional landscape of what P. copri are being exposed to in this gut over time. So a second genome from this set that I think is particularly interesting is this one that I'm showing in the bottom right that just has a question mark under it. And that's because when we first assembled it, we could not figure out what it was. It had no structural similarity to any other genomes that we found, um, and we were unable to classify it. However, a paper then came out describing this new genus called Sibiobacter. And this was described in one of those big metagenome assembled genome papers that I talked about earlier. And they described this genus as actually one of the more prevalent genera in the human gut, but no strong reference for this genus existed because it's been so hard to culture and so hard to assemble. But with nanopore, we were able to get a circular assembly of it and confirm with 16S that it phylogenetically was similar to the Sibiobacter genus. And so Sibiobacter is also a, gen uh, a genus that has lots of insertion sequences, as you can see here in black. It also has five phage regions in it. And so if we look a little bit closer at these phage genomes, we can see that these phage don't only contain the genes that are necessary for, um, for phage propagation, such as capsid genes, but they also have other cargo that will affect its host phenotype such as sigma factors and other genes that are involved in transcriptional regulation, such as secreted proteins, ABC transporters that contribute to antibiotic resistance, et cetera. So here's yet another example of how having a closed bacterial genome can help us learn more about the bacteria. Um, we can de-orphan phages and get some insight into perhaps what environmental exposures this bacteria has been subjected to. So finally, I'd like to give you guys a brief vignette about some very new research coming out of our lab, um, where I've been using nanopore sequencing to classify new microbial dark matter in populations that have been traditionally understudied in the microbiome space. So uh, we have a long-standing collaboration with a team in South Africa to study two different uh, communities there. One is in Soweto and one is in Agincourt, and they are a more urban and more rural community, respectively. And we've been curious what the microbiomes of these South African women look like, as South Africa is a country that is in transition into a much more developed state. And so we previously had done short read sequencing on a number of women from these populations, but unfortunately found that a lot of our short reads could not be classified. So I'm showing you this violin plot on the right of what percent of reads from these women were classifiable. And compared to three Western populations, such as Finland, Sweden, and the US, where the, the majority of their reads were classifiable, we actually found that there were some samples that were very poorly represented in reference databases, more similar to what you see in communities from Tanzania and Madagascar. So we decided to apply some nanopore sequencing to a few of these samples just as a pilot experiment to see if we could assemble some new genomes that are not present in reference databases. And that did end up working out. Um, here I'm showing you one Treponema genome, and Treponema is a spirochete that has evaded um, many culture-based approaches, and we were able to generate a very nice genome of it. Something that I think is interesting is that this trepogeno Treponema genome is much less repetitive, so we don't have as many insertion sequences. I'm just highlighting two here in black, and it only has one small phage region. However, I am curious to explore further why the corresponding short read assembly was so poor. You can see that red track is highly fragmented, so that could be perhaps the presence of other repetitive sequences other than insertion sequences. So finally, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about a limitation of this approach. Um, we've seen in some of our human samples that even bacterial genera that are highly abundant still yield relatively poor assemblies. For example, here we had Bacteroides vulgatus, which is a very prevalent gut organism, present in, um, present in the sample in a very high abundance. However, the genome that I'm showing you on the right, while 
better than the read, cloud, and short read approaches was uh, not a circular genome. And this was disappointing to us because we were starting to get greedy and we really like circular genomes now. Um, so this was left in around five contigs. Uh, but what we realized was that there is an inverse correlation between the number of species that are present of a given genus and the quality of the assembly. So as you can see here, there are actually four different Bacteroides species that are present in some high abundance in this sample, also a number of Parabacteroides. And if you look at the assembly graph of the Bacteroides cluster, it's very knotted up because the Bacteroides have, share so many similar genes, and they also show uh, some extensive gene transfer um, between them. And so I think that this will be resolved as we get longer and longer reads. We'll be able to span more of these shared elements and be able to deconvolute these genome assemblies. So in conclusion, I've talked to you guys about our uh, journey to develop an extraction approach and a computational protocol for long read sequencing of stool. That's available on GitHub, and I'm also excited to say that our manuscript was just accepted a couple weeks ago, so you guys will be able to access that now. Um, I've also talked to you about the circularization of bacterial genomes and how that allows us to gain more insight into their accessory genes and their mobile elements and what is changing in these bacteria over time. Finally, I've talked to you about nanopore sequencing to classify this microbial dark matter in understudied populations, and there will be a preprint of that up on BioArchive hopefully in the next couple months, so you can check that out as well. So with that, I would like to thank all of the members of my lab. It's a really wonderful group. Um, in particular, I'd like to thank Ami, my PI, Fiona Tamburini, who has spearheaded this South Africa project, Eli Moss, who really put in all of the legwork on getting nanopore sequencing up and running in our lab, and my funding. Thank you guys very much.